complex numbers are the topic for chapter 15. And this coordinate system doesn't have an x and y axis. It has a real axis, which is the horizontal one, and an imaginary axis, which is the vertical one. The ordered pair, 2 comma 3, represents the complex number with 2 as its real part and 3 as its imaginary part. We could also think of this complex number as a vector emanating from the origin and terminating at point P. So it would be that vector. This other point, negative 3, 1, that's representing the complex number 3 plus 1i, or just 3 plus i. If z is x plus iy, then the conjugate of z, which is what the little asterisk means up here, would be x minus iy. The imaginary part is what changes in a conjugate. And conjugates are really just reflections in the real axis. So it's a vertical reflection across that real axis. The way we find the modulus of a complex number, if z is equal to a plus bi, the modulus of that is just the Pythagorean theorem. a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Some properties of modulus is here. And you can look at these. One that I'd like to point out that is a little bit different maybe is that when we square the modulus, that's the same thing as taking z times its conjugate. The rest of these are fairly self-evident. So if I want to find the modulus of z given this information, in order to get rid of the absolute values from both sides, we need to square both sides. So we're going to have 25 times the modulus of z plus, minus 1 squared. But if you look back at the properties of modulus, this is the same thing as z minus 1 times z minus 1 times that z minus 1's conjugate. Because z minus 1 is going to be a complex number. And on the other side, we'll have z minus 25 times the conjugate of z minus 25. And one thing to know about conjugates is if we have the sum of two complex numbers and we want the conjugate of that, that's equal to the conjugate of the first plus or minus the conjugate of the second. And we're going to use that fact here. And in essence, although not really, we're going to, in essence, distribute that conjugate symbol. So we'll have 25z minus 1 times the conjugate of z minus 1. The conjugate of 1 is 1 equals z minus 25 times the conjugate of z minus 25. And now we would FOIL both sides. And we'd combine any like terms that we have, collecting them all on one side. And what we end up with is 24 times z times z conjugate equals 600, which is equal to the modulus of z equals 24 if we divide both sides, sorry, 25 if we divide both sides by 24. It should be the modulus squared equals 25. That's just using the same original property that we used in this first step. 
Now we can square root both sides, and the modulus of z is equal to 5. Polar form of a complex number If z is equal to a plus bi, theta, that is the angle that the vector would make with the positive x-axis is called the argument of z. And if we say that r is the absolute value, or the modulus of z, then a would be equal to r cosine theta, and b would be equal to r sine theta. And we could rewrite z as being r times cosine theta plus i sine theta, just factoring the r out. I'm just using simple substitution there. And we have, a, we have a shorthand that we can use for cosine theta plus i sine theta, and that would be cis. So we could say that z, our complex number, is equal to r cis of theta. The conjugate, a reflection across the x-axis, or the real axis in this case, we, could, we would say is r cis negative theta because we're just rotating the other way. The argument would be negative. We'd be turned down across the real axis. And there's another form for a complex number, and that's that this cis of theta is equal to e to the i theta. It's called Euler's form, and that will be derived later in the book. Here are some properties of complex numbers in polar form. If we're multiplying two complex numbers, we just have to add their arguments together. If we're dividing two complex numbers in polar form, we just have to subtract their arguments. And a complex number is the same as another complex number if their arguments are coterminal. That's what the third one says. And proving this using Euler's form is actually pretty easy. If we want to prove this first relationship, we're going to change to Euler's notation, each of these using an e, e to the i theta times e to the i phi. Now properties of exponents say we can add those exponents together. And now we just change from Euler's notation back to using CIS. If I want to write z equals 1 plus the square root of 3, I in polar form, I need to figure out the modulus and I need to find out the argument. And a diagram can be very helpful here. I can plot that complex point so it has a real coordinate of 1, an imaginary coordinate of square root of 3, which means that R the modulus of z would be 2. And we can use SOHCAHTOA, specifically sine, as being the square root of 3 over 2. The sine of our argument is square root 3 over 2. That means theta, our argument, is pi over 3. So 1 plus square root 3i in polar form is 2 cis pi over 3. And if I want to take that complex number times 2 cis pi over 6, I'm going to take 2 times 2 and get 4. 
And then pi over 3 plus pi over 6, that's a property we had, and I get pi over 2. I could illustrate this on an argand diagram, and that just essentially means plot this in that complex plane. So my original number, 1 plus square root 3i, is here. Our complex number has pi over 3 as its angle and a modulus of 2. Once we multiply it, now it has a modulus of 4 and an angle of pi over 2. So to summarize that, what transformation has happened? There's been a rotation of pi over 6. There's been that much extra rotation given, and the length of this number has doubled. The distance from the origin has doubled. We can use this idea to figure out what cosine of 7 pi over 12 and sine of 7 pi over 12 are in simplest and rationalized exact form. That's what surd means. We know that cosine 7 pi over 12 plus I sine pi over 12, 7 pi over 12, we know that that's equal to CIS, 7 pi over 12, which we could rewrite as the sum of two angles. That sum is pi over 4 plus pi over 3. And we can use properties of polar complex numbers to split this up. And then I'm going to rewrite this again, not using the CIS, and I'm going to change it to rectangular form. Remember, CIS of pi over 4 means cosine pi over 4 plus I sine pi over 4. And then CIS of pi over 3 means cosine pi over 3 plus I sine pi over 3. And if we FOIL this, expand this out, what we will end up with is 1 minus the square root of 3 over 2 square root of 2 plus i times the square root of 3 plus 1 over 2 square root 2. And these will correspond. And the last thing it says, since we want it in third form, simplified radical form, um, we need to rationalize this. So multiplying the top and bottom of each of these by the square root of 2, we end up with the cosine 7 pi over 12 is equal to the square root of 2 minus the square root of 6 over 4. And the sine of 7 pi over 12 is equal to the square root of 6 plus the square root of 2 over 4. Those are the exact values for this. And we accomplish that by using complex numbers.